Working From Home webinar series presented by Aculon. Today we're going to be talking about hydrophilic surface treatments. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Edward Hughes. I'm the CEO of Aculon and I'm joined on this call with Eric Bruner, who is the president and founder of Aculon and Mario Gattuso, our senior business development manager. Just a couple of quick logistical things. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. Uh, we will be sending a link to you later uh, today, which will give you a uh, ability to download the presentation and also to watch the recording. So if you have colleagues that are, who are unable to make this uh, webinar today, please feel uh, free to forward that link to them uh, so they can see this, uh, sh this short webinar. Uh, it will also be interactive, and so please uh, ask questions as we go along. Please type them into the uh, GoToMeeting question tab, uh, and at the end of the uh, webinar, we'll leave enough time to go through each of these questions. So again, uh, please type questions as we, as we go along as things pop, pop into your head. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us. Um, I hope everybody is well and safe. Uh, obviously, we are working our way through this pandemic. Uh, the scope, the speed, the stakes uh, obviously all caught everybody by surprise. Uh, and as a result, we've had to adapt to a different way of working. At Aculon, our company, we've had many people uh, working from home. Uh, uh, our business has been uh, operating still as we are an essential company. We're a specialty chemical company. Uh, so our lab and our production facilities have been operating at full speed. Uh, and we've been slowly bringing our uh, uh, business development administration team back into the offices over the last few weeks. Now, we're based here in uh, San Diego, California. Uh, during this time frame, this is our uh, ninth of our series of in the webinar series uh, where we have been basically trying to uh, provide some educational information to uh, people uh, such that you know we are there for you when we come out of this hopefully this webinar will provide some interesting insights and some information that could be useful for you so let me uh, talk a little bit about uh, Aculon so our goal is to enable customers to make better products by being an innovative, responsive, and fast developer and producer of best-in-class surface modification technologies. We believe that together we create winning products. So that's our, our goal. Today in this brief 30-minute uh, webinar, I'm going to give you a quick overview of Aculon, talk a little bit about some of the technology platforms that we have and some surface modification options. And then Eric Bruner is going to take you through talking about hydrophilic applications, what hydrophilic means and the technology and how you measure it, and then give you some examples of the types of things that we do, whether it's in the electronics, the oil and gas, or the specialty marketplaces. Uh, and then we'll conclude with talking a little bit about our lab services business, how we interact with our customers, and then we'll try and tackle as many uh, questions as we, as we possibly can. So as a company, as you'll see from this uh, slide, we are involved in many different industries, whether it's uh, consumer electronics, whether it's industrial applications, whether it's medical devices, or even oil and gas. Uh, so we've reached out and touched a lot of surfaces uh, over the years. The company was founded in 2004 uh, with the purpose of basically developing and producing surface solutions to modify a broad variety of surfaces. It could be metals, glass, polymers, and that's where we really built up our expertise. We modify those surfaces to basically functionalize them such that they could be hydrophobic or super hydrophobic, oleophobic, hydrophilic, which is obviously the topic for today's conversation, uh, anti-fingerprinting or even adhesion promotion. Our treatments are thin. Uh, they are easy to apply. We don't do anything in vacuum chambers. Uh, there are many different application methodologies. Often no cure is required. They're safe, they're non-toxic, and we offer green options to help support your sustainability requirements. We like to think as a company that we differentiate ourselves, not only creating innovative treatments, but really our willingness to work with customers to solve problems. Uh, we're not a company that believes that we just throw something over the fence, uh, provide you a treatment and say, here you go, try it, uh, as opposed to we really like to try and understand what is the problem you're trying to solve uh, and work with you to help solve that problem. We are organized into three focus areas, electronics, oil and gas, and specialty, which is really a catch-all. It includes a number of things, including medical and industrial type applications. 
Our business model is predominantly we produce chemistry. So we work with customers to get our treatments qualified uh, and then we ship you chemistry or we ship it to your contract manufacturer uh, to be applied in that facility. Uh, we do uh, treat some parts in-house uh, for small production runs, uh, some very special type uh, ap applications, uh, but the majority of what we do is produce chemistry and ship that to you. Uh, we've built a good portfolio of IP. We have over 35 uh, patents granted. Uh, we've worked on thousands of applications and we've invested hundreds of thousands of hours becoming surface solution experts. We have over 100 products. Our people are smart, numerous chemists, PhDs, master's degrees, electrical, mechanical engineers. Uh, and we are located here in San Diego, California. That's where our headquarters is, our lab, our manufacturing facilities. Uh, we have operations in Shanghai, Singapore, Dallas, Amsterdam, uh, and we have over 12 distributors uh, in Asia. So let me talk a little bit about why do hydrophilic surfaces matter? Well, what we've found is obviously the interaction with surfaces can create problems. Uh, and so hydrophilic technologies can be used to address a wide variety of those problems. And here's a, kind of seven examples of those type of issues. So it could be a functional issue created by a liquid behavior on the surface that you didn't want to have. It could be that the surface has become contaminated and you can now see fingerprints that degrades the aesthetic behavior of that surface. It could be that the water droplets are impeding optical performance if you are looking to try and uh, basically look through a security camera or something like that. Uh, it could be um, you know, water droplets on lenses and domes. Uh, it could be that the surface is not lubricious enough. Uh, it could be that you're looking to change the wettability and the properties of a surface or a powder, uh, or you basically want to prevent bubble formation uh, in underwater situations. So, so when the company started, uh, the company started with a technology which is called self-assembled model as phosphonates or SAMPs as we call it, uh, and that basically changes uh, the functionality of the surface. Uh, and it's a very thin, uh, often, you know, kind of two to four nanometers uh, in length. Uh, so a very thin surface um, treatment that's applied whereby we're basically bonding the phosphonate head group into the oxide on the metal. Uh, and then we are functional, functionalizing the tail to repel or water, oil or water, and, or it could be as well attracting water. So this group has uh, been a pretty broad uh, uh, variety of and versatile technology for us where we've looked at a lot of different applications uh, where we can modify that. But that gave us really the start to the business. Um, and since then, we've been basically investing and building a series of platforms around that, uh, whether it's polymeric organometallics, whether it's transition metal complexates, surface polymers, and more recently, a lot of work on hydro and oleophilic type applications. So consequently, now we have a series of expertise, uh, all related to surface modifications. It could be hydrophobic treatments, it could be adhesion promotion, it could be water barrier protection, oleophobic, particle treatments, or uh, anti-fingerprinting. And then obviously, finally, what we're going to be talking about today is hydrophilic treatments. So let me ask my colleague, uh, Eric Bruner, to uh, take this uh, from here. Thank you, Edward, and thank you for everyone for uh joining us today. Um, so I'll walk you through some of our hydrophilic options. Um, hydrophilic means uh, water loving. And so basically a hydrophilic treatment attracts water. It makes water spread on a surface. Um, it helps it spread uniformly. And uh, generally we're targeting low water contact angles. So, uh, you know, a really good hydrophilic surface will be less than 10 degrees. Um, Optically clear is, is important for a lot of applications, especially, um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, security domes or uh, ski goggles, uh, prescription eyewear, you, you know, a lot of optical applications where you want to have it clear and, and we can do that. Um, our treatments uh, are flexible, so they can be applied to a lot of different types of substrates, metal, glass, ceramics a lot of different types of functional polymers. And um, the uh, application is, um, you know, is, is pretty broad. So the first uh, question we always ask is, you know, what is the substrate? Um, and then we can move from there to 
deciding what types of treatments will react with the substrate. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, we can modify basically all metals and oxide containing surfaces. Uh, we have several different classes of chemistry that can do that, both transition metal complexates. Um, we can grow polymers from a surface, so surface grown polymers, and then um, there's a lot of uh, polymeric organometallics that apply. Um, for non-oxide surfaces, um, we really have to take advantage of our organometallic chemistry uh, using uh, transition metal complexates once again, or we can um, deposit an oxide and then grow a surface polymer, or we, we can use our, uh, our polymeric organometallics. So the, um, the way that hydrophilic performance is um, typically measured is both contact angles. Um, you can measure the angle that the water um, is on a surface and for a hydrophilic surface you want to have a really low contact angle. So um, you know a lot of times we're bringing uh, contact angles down from the initial conditions of you know anywhere from 60 to even 90 degrees, 80 degrees and then bringing it down to less than 10. Another important uh, parameter uh, performance metric is durability. Um, here, you know, you really have good durability. You want to have good bonding to a surface. You want to have chemical bonds being formed between the substrate and the treatment. And um, you also want to have the, uh, the treatment thermally stable. So um, most of our treatments are, um, you know, stable up to 200, 225. Some of them are even up to 300, but, um, you know, it kind of depends on the substrate and also the treatment, um, you know. Abrasion resistance is another key metric. You know, we do a lot of uh, linear abrasion with um, abrasers to look at, you know, how many wipes a treatment can survive. And we have uh, treatments that can survive, you know, tens of thousands of abrasion cycles. So that's important. Also the chemical stability. A lot of times that has to do with the stability of the underlying substrate, um, but it also has to do with the treatment. So, um, you know, having good stability is important and also um, for outdoor environment applications, you know, we need to look at UV uh, resistance and, and we do have some treatments that are stable to, to UV. So for application process, um, you know, everything we apply is, is a solution phase based. So you can use any solution phase process, whether it's dip, blow coat, dispense, a lot of our treatments can be sprayed. And then, you know, the, the kind of the key parameters around that are, you know, what kind of thickness you want to deposit and so what kind of concentrations you use, uh, solvent choice, um, and then, you know, um, of course, where you want to deposit it, <clears throat> coverage. And then um, some of our hydrophilic treatments are, are room temperature uh, cured. Some of them do require a, a thermal cure. Um, and so that's, that's also part of the consideration. So we focus on um, three kind of general areas, as Edward mentioned. Um, we have, uh, you know, quite a bit of business in electronics. Uh, there's there's uh, some good oil and gas applications for hydrophilics, and a lot of medical and specialty opportunities. So in electronics, um, you know, we have uh, applications around anti fingerprinting, um, you know, appliances. Uh, the, uh, we just jump back. Okay, that's that's good. Um, and so the, uh, you know, for AFP, we know it's uh, anti-fingerprinting. We focus on hiding power, um, initial fingerprint, um, you know, surface energy. Um, there's a lot of uh, easy clean um, aspects to that of just making oils and, and fingerprints easy to remove. Um, you know, we, we focus on uh, on the uh, different approaches. A lot of times just looking at colors and texture is important. So this is another slide on AFP coatings. Um, you know, the, the general thing is to both hide the oil initially and then make it easy to clean. Uh, of course, you, you want to have your treatments durable. And, um, you know, when it comes to uh, hiding power, a lot of times you can work with texture to affect the performance. You know, having a good matte finish is important. 
Um, it allows kind of diff diffuse reflection and, and good hiding power. Glossy is, is a little bit worse. And then also uh, color is an important aspect of, of AFP, you know, choosing something that um, doesn't have as much contrast um, is important. So if you can go to a kind of highly reflective surface that, that helps provide additional hiding power, darker colors are a little bit more challenging. Okay, and then so in oil and gas, there's um, there are quite a few applications that need uh, hydrophilic um, treatments. Um, one of the things we found out early on was um, with hydrophilic treatments, the ability to kind of attract water is beneficial because it also repels oil. So one of the first kind of uh, initial projects we worked on was for um, anti-fouling of spill containment booms. So we worked on ways to modify um, you know, PVC and polyurethane with hydrophilic treatments to repel oil. Um, also, there's quite a few applications that just, you want to look for anti-fog, you want to prevent uh, condensation from pro providing issues. Um, and so these are, um, you know, these are applications that require, um, you know, good hydrophilic properties that are, that are durable, that are, you know, robust and survive through in aggressive environments. Um, and last but not least, uh, specialty. Um, quite a few medical applications that need hydrophilic treatments. Um, once again, anti-fog. Um, and then um, kind of an interesting aspect of hydrophilics is they provide bubble repellents. So that means that air bubbles uh, are not, uh, don't adhere to hydrophilic surfaces underwater. And so in the medical device uh, world, there's, um, Quite a few applications for hydrophilic treatments. Um, a lot of times um, they're used for lubricity, um, where we're trying to reduce the coefficient of friction between uh, two different surfaces. Um, you know, whether those are capillaries or catheters, um, there's quite a few different devices that benefit from lubricious surfaces. And, um, you know, there's um, even kind of uh, good uh, protein and blood repellency um, when the, you know when these things see just kind of a wet water surface a lot of times they don't adhere so they, they're good for um, repellency and um, there's quite a few um, different types of diagnostic uh, polymeric sur surfaces that um, need to have good wetting of, of biological fluids so we can treat those surfaces with a hydrophilic treatment and improve wetting and um, you know as, as kind of our we have a bunch of different types of chemistry that can be used on different, a wide range of substrates. And, um, you know, one of our strengths is chemical bonding. So providing robust, long lasting treatments is, is the goal. Anti-fog is a, you know, a very uh, good application for hydrophilic treatments. Um, you know, a lot of times you're trying to prevent fogging by um, condensating water. So when, when a surface is, is cold, um, it tends to condense water and you want a hydrophilic treatment to spread that water out and not to beat up. And that helps prevent the fogging and uh, optical interference. So we do quite a bit of, um, we do quite a few uh, security domes uh, that get sent to us and are treated. Um, we also have, um, you know, other types of optical, whether it's, <laughs> prescription eyewear, sunglasses, um, you know, other types of optical things you want to be able to see through. Um, we have a, a range of different anti-fog products. So I mentioned this earlier, bubble repellency is, um, is an interesting one, um, whether it's a fluidic device where you don't want the bubble to interfere with, um, you know, visualizing the, the fluid or whether it's a sensor our optical component, a lot of times bubbles can interfere. And so um, the trick here is just to apply hydrophilic treatment. It, it attracts the water and it keeps the um, kind of hydrophobic gases, bubbles, you know, gases are <clears throat> ambient air is just mostly nitrogen and oxygen and they, they do tend to uh, stick to hydrophobic surfaces. So making them hydrophilic solves the issue. 
Great. Thanks, Eric. That's uh, helpful. So as uh, Eric kind of talked about, we have a number of different treatments um, that can be applied to a number of different applications uh, that are seeing a number of different surface related issues. Uh, so it's kind of a interesting situation where you know, how we like to work with our customers is, you know, you've got a lot of different things going on uh, in terms of options and functionalities you're looking for. Uh, so we like to work with you in a way that basically hopefully helps you hit your target. Uh, so rather than just send treatments, you know, throw them over the fence and hope that you hit that target, uh, we get a little bit more involved in how we work with you. Uh, we like to start with really understanding what is your requirement, what functionality you're looking for, what is that surface going to see, what kind of conditions are likely to degrade that surface. Uh, and then we will get some substrates in, we can treat them uh, in our lab facilities, we'll you know, analyze them, we'll characterize them, we'll send them back to you, uh, you can test them and you can give us feedback if that's you know, meeting the mark, not meeting the mark, if there's some changes. Uh, we then go through a process where we'll optimize it for you uh, and then finish with a, you know, the, the right treatment that works for you with a recommendation on how best to apply it. Uh, that then can go obviously to your uh, plant uh, where you can run a plant trial uh, and if we've done our job uh, then hopefully we can help you hit that target. So it's a bit more of an involved process uh, rather than as I say just uh, kind of throwing a, a substrate or a treatment at you and hoping that it works. Uh, you know, and we've done we do this because we've built up a lot of IP and expertise over the years whether it's you know the 35 patents, the trade secrets we've got, the We've treated and tested thousands of applications. Uh, we have access to just terrific analytical equipment, whether here at the Aculon Lab, as you can see on the right-hand side, or whether at uh, University of California, San Diego. We have a partnership there that gives us access to millions of dollars of, of equipment. We've spent hundreds of thousands of hours solving surface problems. Uh, and as Eric alluded to, it's sometimes, you know, what a customer comes in asking for, uh, maybe it's, you know, they're thinking they need a hydrophobic treatment, and in fact, they need a hydrophilic type treatment. And it's that kind of expertise that we've spent, you know, millions of dollars uh, building up. And so hopefully, you know, we can help you hit the target uh, and uh, achieve, you know, our goal of helping you make better products. We offer also offer a number of sustainability options. Uh, our goal is that you know we want to be good you know citizens of the planet, uh, and we want to basically help our customers support uh, their sustainability goals uh, so they can help protect the environment as well. Uh, and we do that by offering treatments that are VOC exempt, by PFOA free products, uh, eco packaging, waste reduction uh, opportunities, you know reduce transportation costs, etc. And even you know. Things like creating sustainable increased efficiency at our own headquarters. Everything's been retrofitted to LEDs. Uh, so, you know, hopefully we can help you achieve some of your sustainability goals as well as these have become increasingly important over the last few years. So, in conclusion, we are a platform technology company that makes uh, customers' products better. Uh, that's what we do. We are surface solution experts. Uh, today we focused on hydrophilic. Uh, as you saw from the intro uh, slides, we do a lot of different functionalities. So if you have opportunities outside of hydrophilic, then please contact us as well. Uh, we have a strong history of working with customers to solve problems. Uh, we've built up a big and a broad portfolio of products, which do offer you know, a number of sustainable options as well. And, and we've built up this expertise, whether it's our IP or testing capabilities, uh, such that you know we can help you uh, hit the target. Uh, so with that, let me uh, turn to uh, look at some of the questions that have come in. Uh, and if you haven't sent anything in yet, please uh, please feel free to type stuff in, and we'll try and address as as many as possible. Uh, okay, so there's a question around which substrate do you use for medical applications, uh, malic and and hydride or PVP? Eric, I'm not sure I fully understand the uh, uh, the question, but uh, if you do, could you uh, potentially answer that? Uh, sure. So um, I would have to look back at um, what we've done on those particular polymers, but we do have a number of options to work with, um, especially if it's um, a two-step process that we can use. 
So um, we probably need to drill down into what the requirements are, but um, you know, we do have options for, for modifying those, those types of polymers. Okay, uh, next question is for you, Eric. Uh, what does water contact angle less than 10 mean exactly? Um, so that's using the um, half angle method um, essentially, you're looking at the, the droplet on the surface, and when you um, measure the angle through the top of the apex of the of the droplet, um, you know it's it's less than 10 degrees. So that you know, essentially, you're looking at a very flat droplet that's spread out, that's really you know really thin. Um, a lot of times what we'll describe in terms of um, really good hydrophilicity uh, is, is water break free condition where when you put water onto a surface, it spreads out and it's flat and it doesn't break. It doesn't have um, places where the water beads up at all. Okay, great. And yes, uh, so the opposite of that is hydrophobic where you'll see the water beat up into a, into a, a droplet. So yes, it's uh, in this case, hydrophilic is wetting out on the surface. Uh, next question, is the presentation available for sharing? Yes, I, we will be sending a link to all the registrants of this webinar that will have a uh, link where you can download the presentation as well as a link to the recording of this uh, uh, webinar so you can forward to your, your colleagues. Uh, Eric, the next one's for you. Can the hydrophilic coating be used on plastic type lenses in the eye like contact lenses? Um, yeah, we do have a number of um, non-toxic, um, you know, biocompatible hydrophilic treatments, and um, we've had um, some actually some experience in the contact lens area, especially for release of the lens from molds when they're being made, um, and um, it's it's definitely an important. Uh, uh, area for for treatment. So yes, I think we can we can help um, this company or an individual. Okay. Uh, next one's for you, Eric. What is the durability of hydrophilic coatings? And there's a follow-up question to that. Over time, uh, do they become inactivated by dust, pollution, etc., increasing the water wetting con water wetting angle? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, they can be used for um, <clears throat> um, pretty uh, uh, challenging environments. Um, the uh, the coatings that we typically employ are, um, you know, cross-linked and durable. They they're reacted to the surface, so they they are um, you know durable. Um, typically, we're measuring you know thousands of abrasion cycles. Um, you know, twenty, thirty, forty thousands. Uh, you know, hard force like one, you know, 500 grams to one kilo per square centimeter type abrasion force and seeing, you know, retention of the hydrophilic properties. Um, and like any coating, they can be um, contaminated by um, dust or other types of contaminants and um, they can foul the surface, but Depending on the environment, a lot of times those um, contaminants can be either um, wiped off or rinsed away. So um, usually we can see um, pretty good uh, performance for a lot of different environments. Okay. Uh, another question is, what is the typical project length? And, and that's that's obviously a, a uh, <laughs> the answer is it depends. We have had opportunities have come in, and, and within a month or two, they like the solution. And then we have other opportunities that come in that have more medical or requirement FDA type applications, and that can take 18 months to two years. So uh, it really depends on the types of uh, what that substrate is going to see, the types of conditions, etc. So, uh, if you can uh, just reach out to us, we can maybe give you a little bit uh, better understanding. All right, Eric, uh, next one's for you. Uh, can some of your coatings survive the medical sterilization process? Oh, that's a good question too. Um, yes, um, and we're um, we're actually actively involved in a couple projects relating to that. Um, some of the uh, regulatory changes around sterilization, um, where they've um, gotten away from 
ETO to having to do either gamma or um, UV type um, sterilization methods. Um, we do have some options that can survive those conditions. So, so the answer is yes, uh, we can help um, provide coatings that survive a range of different sterilization techniques. Okay, uh, another question. Are there any differences between polymer material, polymer material PU, silicone, uh, in terms of efficacy for hydrophilics? Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, yes, our, um, for a lot of the polymers we're using are organometallic type chemistry and they generally react with functional polymers that either have oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, or some type of um, you know, unsaturation along the backbone. Um, silicones are difficult to adhere to. Um, so yeah, polyurethanes are much better. We can adhere to them. Silicones, um, we do still have some options where we can um, um, deposit, um, a lot of times we'll just deposit a, a layer of, of metal oxide first and then modify them. Um, so we, we do have options, but there, there are differences between um, the different uh, polymers that are out there and the degree of bonding we can achieve. Okay. Uh, then as a question, as I, I see you have a facility in Amsterdam. Can I get testing done at the facility? Our facility in Amsterdam is for uh, uh, business development and for logistics. It's where we keep our European uh, uh, inventory and warehousing. Uh, so the testing is done in, in San Diego, California. So um, next question for you, Eric, is how do the hydrophilic coatings work on synthetic textile polymers? So I'm assuming they're probably referring to polyester or nylon. Um, we do have options for those um, textiles um, and we can, um, we can modify them. So, um, you know, some of the textiles are a little bit limited in terms of long-term durability for wash cycles. So some of our treatments can withstand, you know, 20, 30 wash cycles, but then they start to uh, release so it, it we'll have to kind of dig into the details of what they're needing but we do have options for synthetic uh, textiles okay and the same uh, uh, attendee asked uh, are all the systems insolvent or some water-based um, most of ours are insolvents um, we do have a couple aqueous systems we can work with um, but I would say, you know, 95% of what we do is in, a, is in a, a solvent of one type or another. And um, a lot of times we'll have freedom over the type of solvent that's used, whether it's, um, you know, choosing the right kind of evaporation rate or if there's a, you know, uh, an EHS concern around, um, you know, flammability or toxicity. A lot of times we have some choices on what types of um, solvent carriers we use. Okay, uh, what are the limitations for the hydrophilic coatings? Uh, limitations are really kind of, um, a lot of times they're substrate based. So we just, um, you know, the, 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 the stronger the substrate is, the more, you know, the harder it is or the more chemically resistant it is, the better it is for us and for our treatments. Um, when you have something that's um, not chemically stable or kind of um, not a very hard or durable substrate, then we have kind of limitations. So um, a lot of times kind of general rule of thumb is we're as durable as at the underlying substrate. Okay. And another substrate related question is, do you have hydrophilic solutions for low surface energy polymers like polypropylene? Um, yeah, boy, that's... That's a that's a that's a challenging one. Um, there's not a lot to react with on on polypropylene or polyolefins that don't have any sort of function, you know, any sort of uh, real reactive group to react with. Um, there are some strategies to 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 look at those surfaces. Um, one of the ways is just depositing a hydrophilic that's not soluble in water. So you just have something that's got film forming uh, capabilities that lays down and then isn't um, you know dissolved in water when it's exposed to water. Um, so we can modify um, polyolefins, but not with really much bonding. Um, once again, there's a routes to get there if 
the part is valuable enough. So if we can get into, you know, a sputtering approach or some sort of oxide deposition, atmospheric or, or vacuum based, um, then we can, you know, modify on top of that. But direct bonding to polypropylene isn't um, really possible. So um, we'd probably have to get into the conditions that the treatment needs to survive and then comment on whether we really have anything to offer or not. Okay. Uh, next question is, what pH range is the coating compatible with? with and I know we've got a number of uh, coatings, but maybe you can give a, a, a general uh, kind of range. Um, our hydrophilics are actually pretty good across a broad range of pHs. Um, you know, we've got um, some of our hydrophilics are, you know, polyurethane based. Others are acrylamides. Um, you know, some of the polymer chains are pretty stable across both acid and base. Um, a lot of the limitation ends up being around the underlying substrate. Um, so, like I said before, if it's something that it's a weak substrate, not stable in a in a strong, you know, high pH or low pH environment, then we may have some issues. But um, there's there's approaches to getting around that as well. So that kind of gets into the the whole area of all of our years of experience of looking at different substrates. So there are, there are some tricks we can play to um, you know enhance the stability. Okay, uh, another question is, do either hydrophobic or hydrophilic coatings have adhesion challenges to smooth as opposed to textured glass? Um, that's a good question too. Um, a lot of times um, texturing does help, um, especially with uh, thicker film, you know, film uh, coatings that cross-link you can get some mechanical interlock with roughening and, and so that really helps. Um, but at the same time, a lot of our treatments are, you know, they're not relying on mechanical interlock. They actually will react with the surface. So then that enables you to go to a smooth uh, surface. Um, we have a lot of kind of good examples in the area of adhesion promotion um, on like smooth copper foil versus roughened copper and there's a lot of um, importance to that in electronics and it's kind of the same thing for hydrophilics um, because we can actually chemically bond to the surface um, we allow you to go to a smooth surface versus having to rely on mechanical interlock and roughening okay and it looks like the final question is for applications where diffusivity of water and oil are of concern can these coatings also prevent diffusion of microscopic particles? Oh, that's an interesting question too. Um, yeah, actually we have quite a, we, over the last several years, we've gotten a lot of experience um, with these types of um, questions um, with our with our Nanoproof uh, product range, where we're trying to protect circuitry from, from damage um, from, you know, water and salts and other things. Um, so, um, you know, generally the thicker the coating is, the better you're going to have a barrier. Um, diffusion of small molecule gases and things like that will still have some permeability. Um, we do have some data around this on some of our um, different treatments, so um, there might be a chance that we can help them. So I would encourage them to, um, you know, send it in a query and, and kind of give us um, some specifics on what you're looking for and, and hopefully we can help them. Okay, thank you. One more question came in. Any high heat applications, examples such as engine parts? Ooh, that's uh, that's pretty hot. Um, yeah, most of our, I mean, all of our treatments are organic based or organometallic based. And um, in the presence of oxygen, um, most of them um, are stable up to about 225C, 250C, and then at that point you start to get thermal oxidation. So you'll, you know, in the presence of oxygen and heat, you start to, to actually kind of burn the material. So, so there are limitations. The engine um, is a is a hot environment. I'm not sure specifically what where, where in the engine and what temperature it is, but. If it's over 225, 250 in the presence of oxygen, we're probably um, not able to, to help them. Okay. And actually, one more. Are there limitations for coding the internal diameter of opaque or translucent materials, uh, tubing specifically? The guy just clarified. 
Um, actually, we have um, you know quite a few tubing um, uh, applications where you know being thin and being nanoscale is really important. Um, and so, if it's a you know small interior diameter tube, um, you know we have a number of different companies that send us capillary parts every month to treat. Um, and so um, we might be able to help them. If it's a reactive substrate that we can react with, that definitely helps. Um, so yeah, I would I would also encourage them to contact us with some more um, more specifics. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you, Eric. That was very helpful, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us. As I say today, you'll be getting an email uh, which will give you a link to the recording and a link to uh, download the webinar presentation. Uh, they will give you obviously contact information if you want to reach out to us and uh, and if we can address any further questions that would be great. I hope this has been helpful, I hope this has given you a little bit of an insight into uh, hydrophilic treatments and a little bit of insight into what Achillon does. Uh, I wish you all the best as you work your way through this pandemic and please stay safe and uh, hopefully uh, you know, you'll know you contact us and hopefully we can help you make your products better. Uh, that's what we do and uh, we appreciate you taking the time today. So with that, I will end the webinar. Thank you.